My talk is called Optimizing Load Balancing and Auto-Scaling for LLM Inference on Kubernetes. I know that's kind of a mouthful, uh, but let's just get right into it. Um, first, a uh, personal introduction. I'm David. Um, I work for Red Hat. I'm a performance engineer. Uh, I'm based out of Toronto, Canada. In the past, like a couple of years ago, I was working mostly on Kubernetes operator development um, for out-of-tree kernel driver enablement and node tuning. Uh, but then for the last like almost two years now, I've been just focused on LLM inference performance on Kubernetes. Uh, I'm part of the performance and scale for AI platforms team at Red Hat. Um, and our kind of mission is to make AI applications run better and faster on Linux and containers and Kubernetes. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to start with a little bit of background information about LLM inference and LLM inference performance concepts. If you're in here for the previous talk, there might be a tiny bit of review here, um, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, then I'm going to talk about different ways to deploy LLMs on Kubernetes. So I'll show sort of the vanilla way, um, and then I'll introduce the KSERF project. Um, then I'm going to show some comparisons of load balancing performance when you're deploying multiple replicas of a model, uh, the vanilla way versus with KSERV. Um, and then I'm also going to show some results with custom load balancing. Um, and then lastly, I'll discuss some issues involved in auto scaling and share some techniques to speed up the scale up process of new model replicas. Um, and I hope to leave some time for Q&A at the end. I have a lot to get through, so we'll see how that goes, but please hold your questions till the end. Um, okay, so first, the background. So yeah, by now, I think most of us are pretty familiar with how LLMs work at a high level. It's been kind of hard to ignore, but just looking at this diagram on the left, I want to highlight first how LLMs, are decom or LLMs process text as tokens. So the incoming text is decomposed into tokens, which map to words or subword pieces of text. Um, I also want to note how text generation is an autoregressive process, so the next token is based on the previous tokens in the sequence. So basically, to generate a long string of output, the model needs to be run over and over again, um, each time kind of adding the previous output token into the input sequence to generate the next token. Um, and this occurs until either a max number of tokens is reached or the model predicts the stop token, uh, which is like the logical end of that uh, statement. So this means that compared to other server workloads, the LLM inference involves really long-lived requests sometimes. Uh, the total response time completely depends on the number of tokens that are in the output. So it can range from like sub-second to multiple minutes of generating output for one request. Um, okay, so why do we care about optimizing the performance of LLMs? Um, LLMs are usually deployed on hardware accelerators like GPUs. So any organization that's making the investment into this expensive hardware wants to get the most out of it. Uh, furthermore, accelerators for AI usually consume a lot of energy, so in the interest of cost and energy savings, optimizing performance is critical. Um, and lastly, I want to mention sort of a recent trend towards use cases of LLMs that involve generation with really long sequences of text, um, longer than, say, like a chat use case. So that includes RAG, which you've probably already heard about today many times, um, and also chain of thought, which is kind of like what OpenAI is doing with their latest generation of models, where basically before they answer a question, they generate a really long string of basically a plan of how they're going to answer that. Um, and what this means is basically we're doing more work during the inference step instead of, say, running a longer or running a bigger model or doing training for longer or training on more data. Um, but what that means is that for user experience, the speed of inference is even more critical. Um, so how do we actually run an LLM? In production, LLMs are usually deployed with a piece of software that's called an inference engine or model server. Sometimes you'll hear these referred to as runtimes. Um, there are several LLM-focused inference engines like VLLM, text generation inference, and there's many more. Uh, in this talk, I'm just going to be basically using VLLM and showing results with VLLM. But I think the load balancing and auto-scaling concepts that I'll go over uh, are relevant for any of these. Um, so inference engines like these usually contain the dependencies and logic for loading model weights from standard formats and running them. Uh, they often include like an HTTP or gRPC interface to serve requests by an API. Um, and they often contain highly optimized kernels for running the model on hardware accelerators. Um, and then one critical feature that each of these inference engines offer is the ability to process many requests in parallel. Um, for LLMs, this is a little bit tricky because each request needs to run for several iterations, and we don't know upfront how long it may need to run. Um, so these runtimes have implemented a feature called continuous batching or dynamic batching, where basically between each token generation step, 
requests which are queued can be added into the batch and completed requests can be removed from the batch and returned. Um, there's a ton of other really interesting uh, optimizations that are at this runtime level that are relevant for performance, but I'm just gonna put those topics aside for this talk. Um, so now just briefly, uh, how do we measure LLM inference performance? Like other server workloads, performance is usually measured in terms of latency and throughput. Um, but because, again, the total response time totally depends on the sequence length, usually we look at latency in terms of time per output token. So in the case of streaming requests, we can measure the time to the first token and the inter-token latency. Um, so TTFT will include any queuing time in the case where the server is too busy to instantly process a request. Um, and it also includes the pre-fill time when the input prompt is initially processed by the model. And then inter-token latency, or ITL, this is sometimes also called TPOT, uh, is the time between subsequent tokens, not including the first token. Um, and then throughput could be measured in terms of like requests per second, um, but for the same reason that we measure per token latency, it's usually measured in terms of tokens per second. And when we talk about the throughput performance of an LLM, we're usually talking about the total tokens per second across multiple ongoing requests. Um, so you can think of like TTFT and ITL are basically what a client experiences. Throughput is more a measure of how much output a server can generate in a given amount of time. Um, and then in order to get these measurements, we can run load tests. There's several open source tools for load testing LLMs. Any results in this talk are gathered with a tool that my team made called LLM load test, um, but there's others out there. And there's also currently an ongoing effort in the serving working group to come together and create basically a standard tool for benchmarking LLMs on Kubernetes. Um, so that's, I think, a great idea. Um, on the right hand of this slide, I just have some example performance data. Um, on the x-axis, we have throughput, and then on the y-axis, we have average ITL. Um, each point is from a load test simulating a certain number of concurrent users. This is just for illustrative purposes, but note like the latency throughput curve, how there's a trade-off between throughput and latency, uh, depending on the level of concurrency that we're running at. Okay, so now let's get into how to deploy LLMs on Kubernetes. So the kind of easy answer uh, is to deploy an inference engine using a deployment object and then behind a service. The service could be exposed to the outside world by like a root or it could be part of a larger application stack like a chat website. Um, in most production deployments, users don't hit the model directly with requests. There's usually some like pre or post processing application between the actual users making the request and the model. Um, for instance, to validate the inputs and outputs or like uh, hate abuse and profanity filtering, hap filtering is a common use of pre or post processing. Um, but for the purposes of the load balancing discussion, I just want to note how when a server is deployed like this with multiple pod replicas behind a service with a cluster IP, the way that the service load balances between the pod replicas depends on how cube proxy is configured, but it's typically random uh, with an even probability for each replica. Um, so now I want to introduce another way to deploy LLMs in Kubernetes, which is KServe. KServe originally came out of the Kubeflow CNCF project. Um, I think like three years ago now, it graduated to be its own project under the Linux Foundation. Um, KServe provides a set of Kubernetes custom resources for deploying uh, machine learning models. It offers like a complete story for production ML model serving, including prediction, um, pre and post processing, which is what the transformer pods do, um, explainability and monitoring. There's a ton you can do with KServe. It would take like a whole talk or multiple talks to go through all the features. Um, so for this session, I just want to mention the two custom resources that I use to deploy LLMs and then walk you through the architecture just a little bit. Um, so there's the serving runtime custom resource. It's kind of like a template uh, to define how to deploy an inference engine. Um, and then there's the inference service, which includes like model specific fields, like how to load the model, whether it's from S3 or in a PVC or in a container, um, and then which serving runtime to actually use to deploy that model. And then also a deployment mode to use. Um, when you deploy a model with KServe, there's two deployment modes. There's raw deployment, which essentially does what I showed on the previous slide, like the vanilla way. Um, and then there's Knative mode. So Knative is another large CNCF project uh, that enables serverless workloads to run on Kubernetes. Again, it offers a ton of features that I can't get into, but I just want to highlight the load balancing that you get with the Knative deployment mode in KServe, um, which is based on least requests. So the architecture diagram of how it looks when you deploy a model with the Knative deployment strategy is on the right-hand side. So the predictor service in the top right um, forwards requests to the QProxy sidecar container, and this is where load balancing happens. 
Um, so basically, the queue proxy makes some effort to reroute an incoming request to the replica of the model that has the least currently active requests. OK, so let's get into some performance results. So basically, compare these two different schemes. So all of the performance results I'll share in this presentation are with the Llama 3.18b model running on an AWS instance with A10G GPUs with 24 gigabytes of GPU memory. Um, these results are across eight replicas of the model. Um, so each replica of the model is running on GPU, on one GPU. Um, and I'm load testing with inputs from the open ORCA data set with input links between 16 and 1600 tokens, and then outputs between 16 and 1600 tokens. Um, the input and output links will impact the numbers a lot. That's why I note it here. Um, I'm using RPS mode in the load test, so the requests are being scheduled at a constant rate of 12 requests per second. Um, and this setting was chosen based on some initial experiments to basically figure out uh, what level of load can a single replica handle uh, without causing any queuing at the runtime level. Um, so I determined that a single replica could handle 1.5 RPS and achieve intertoken latency below about 70 milliseconds. Uh, and without any queue growing in VLM. So basically, it's enough load that it should not quite fully saturate all eight replicas. Um, so on the right, I have the throughput numbers comparing the performance of the eight replicas when deployed with KServe in the K-native mode and then the vanilla mode or raw deployment mode. Um, so obviously, these results don't look too bad in terms of total throughput across the replicas. The difference is pretty minor. It's like a few percent. Um, but the more interesting difference is in latency and in particular TTFT. So when we look at TTFT for the same experiment, we see a much bigger difference, in particular, a big difference in tail latency, 99th percentile TTFT. Um, the 99th percentile time to first token is like over 20 seconds in the raw deployment node, uh, but only about three seconds with K-native. Um, and this kind of makes sense. So if the requests are being distributed evenly among replicas as they are in the raw deployment case, this doesn't take into account that some requests will last, will last uh, much longer than others based on the sequence length. So Think like even at 60 millisecond ITL, a uh, thousand tokens would take a full minute to generate. Um, so if one replica gets unlucky, it will end up basically with several requests that last quite a long time, but it will continue to get more requests at the same rate as the less busy replicas. Um, and then similarly, other replicas might be underutilized. Um, so in summary, just by switching from random load balancing that you get with a deployment and service to request-based load balancing that you get with Knative, we bring our 99th percentile TTFT uh, from 20 seconds to three seconds. So this is a huge difference. Um, and then on the right, I also have the ITL graph. You can see the difference is more minor. Um, so just to dig into why, uh, on this slide, I show the VLM level metric, so reported from the inference engine, the number of requests waiting, which is basically the queue size for each replica. Um, you can see that two or three replicas out of the eight have at times a queue over 15 requests, and then it peaks at over uh, 35 requests for a single replica. So for the test with K-native load balancing, on the other hand, the maximum queue size at any point during the test was five for one replica. Uh, I don't even put the graph in my slides because it's pretty boring. It's like zero for most of the test. Um, and so in production, I just want to note that the impact of this poor load balancing will depend uh, on the actual user requests coming in. So the exact impact will depend on the, basically the number of tokens coming in and out. Um, for example, if you have like a large text summarization request that are hitting the same model endpoint as chat users, you might have even more variance than like 16 to 1600 tokens, which could make this problem even worse. Similarly, like if you're doing RAG. Um, so this is a really significant difference and really highlights the impact on user experience of poor load balancing for LLM inference. Um, but even with Knative, there still were a few requests that had over five second TTFT. Um, and the 99th percentile is almost three seconds. So that's still quite a long time for a user to wait for their first token back. Uh, so I think there's still room for improvement. So I wanted to see if we could do better uh, than this with some custom load balancing strategies. Um, so how could we improve on request-based load balancing? Where does it fall short? Um, the issue comes down to the fact that the number of re requests which can run in a batch is not constant. It depends on the sequence lengths of the requests. Uh, in other words, the number of tokens in those requests. Um, so keeping the number of re requests per replica equal, like we do with Knative, doesn't mean that each replica is actually equally utilized. Um, the real limiting factor on how many requests can be batched together is the KV cache. Um, you can think of the KV cache as like the model's working memory. Um, more concretely, 
key value pairs derived from the self-attention layers of the model are cached for previous tokens because they're needed to predict future tokens. Um, so this is called the key value cache or KV cache. Um, and this is stored in GPU memory. And the size of the KV cache is basically a function of the number of sequences that are being processed in the current batch and the length of those sequences, and then also the size of the model. Um, so as a result, the maximum batch size and sequence lengths that your model can process will be limited by the KV cache size. So taking a look at the KV cache utilization metrics reported by VLLM, you can see a couple of things. Um, first, in the raw deployment case, you can see a huge range in KV cache utilization throughout the test, where some replicas are at like under 60% at times, while others are near 100. And then in the K-native case, each replica is much more even, um, but there's still times when some replicas are at 100% for extended periods, while others are near 80%. Um, so those replicas that are at 100% utilization won't be able to process a request if, it's, if it arrives um, until some of the current requests are complete. So that's why we get a queue growing still. Um, so in order to avoid or reduce the number of requ requests which end up waiting in a queue, I wanted to experiment uh, with load balancing based on the KV cache utilization reported by VLLM. Um, so the strategy that I came up with was basically scrape the KV cache usage metrics for each replica, and then for each request, pick two replicas randomly, and then send to the lower of the two in terms of KV cache. Um, note that in KServe, there is no built-in solution for custom load balancing like this. So this is basically a proof of concept that I implemented on the client side. Um, in this case, the load tester is running in a pod on the same node as the model replicas. Um, and the results turned out pretty well. So again, the throughput and ITL were pretty close. Not a huge difference, but uh, on the plot of TTFT, you can see that we've really brought down the tail latency even further from like the 2.84 that we had with Knative down to under one second um, with this custom strategy. But um, there's an issue. What if we increase the load to slightly beyond what these eight replicas can handle? So going from 12 RPS to 13 RPS. Um, in this case, interestingly, Knative actually does slightly better than my custom strategy did. And the problem is that under this level of load, when every replica is saturated, the KV cache usage is basically at 100% for every single replica. Um, so when every replica is saturated, it doesn't make sense to look at the KV cache usage percent because none of the replicas have room to add another request. Um, it's like they're all between 98 and 100%. Um, so in this case, it makes more sense to load balance based on the queue size, which is closer to what Knative is doing, um, than to look only at the KV cache usage. Um, and this is illustrated again by the queue size metric from VLLM. I don't show the graph here, but um, the maximums for Knative was 26 requests at any time, and then for the custom strategy was 36. Um, so that brings us to a slightly better strategy, which is load balances based on both the queue length and also the KV cache. Um, the strategy is just scrape both metrics from the VLLM replicas, pick two randomly, and then first pick the one with lower number of requests waiting, but if there's a tie in terms of queue length, then send to the one with the lower KV cache usage. So in effect, we're still load balancing by KV cache usage under manageable load when there's no queues building up, but in the case where the traffic is so high that every replica is saturated, we also take into account the queue length. Um, and on the right, we can see the performance results of this strategy. Um, so under this 13 RPS load, we get results on par with Knative, and then under the previous load of 12 RPS, we get better results than Knative, same as the previous strategy. Um, so this concludes the load balancing performance results I have in this talk. So just to recap, we showed that when deploying multiple replicas of a model, round robin or random load balancing can lead to significant imbalance and really high TTFTs due to queuing. Um, and we showed that request-based load balancing uh, offered by Knative does quite a bit better. Um, and then we showed that we can improve on that even further by custom load balancing on KV cache and queue size. Um, because again, the maximum batch size that VLLM can actually handle is dynamic. It's based on the space in the KV cache. Um, now, before I get into the next part of the talk, I want to address some alternatives to running multiple replicas of your model. So of course, we run multiple replicas of an LLM in order to get more throughput to support more concurrent users or maybe to bring down our latency. But this can also be achieved by distributing a model across multiple accelerators or GPUs. Um, so there's two common ways to do this. There's tensor parallelism and pipeline parallelism. Um, in general, pipeline parallelism is just being used for running like super large models uh, that don't fit in a single node's accelerators across multiple nodes. Um, so I'm going to kind of put that aside and just talk about when to use tensor parallelism. So it should be used, first of all, if the model that you want to run doesn't fit within a single GPU's memory, 
in that case, there's basically no other option. You just have to distribute it across multiple accelerators. Um, aside from that case, tensor parallelism can also be used in some cases to improve latency. This is not always the case, but assuming you have like fast uh, inter-GPU communication, uh, in many cases, you can get a uh, latency improvement with a model distributed across two or more GPUs. And then lastly, the other situation that you might want to use tensor parallelism is if your model does fit in your GPU's memory, but just barely, it almost fills your GPU's memory. Uh, in that case, there's not going to be enough space left for the KV cache, which will limit your batch size um, or sequence length that you can handle. And then in cases like that, uh, you can get a better throughput improvement by increasing the degree of tensor, par tensor parallelism than you would by scaling up the replicas. Um, so looking at the graph on the right as an example, you can see that when we go from one GPU to two GPUs with tensor parallelism, we get slightly better than double the throughput at the same latency. But then when we go to four replicas, we don't get even close to another doubling of throughput. Um, so in this case, it would be better to run two replicas at, with two GPUs uh, than one replica with four GPUs. OK, um, so this is some overlap with the previous talk. I'm going to kind of breeze through this and just say you should watch the recording if you missed the previous talk. They go into much more depth of which triggers to use for auto-scaling. Um, I'll just note that um, with Knative, Knative supports concurrency-based auto-scaling, uh, RPS-based auto-scaling, and then CPU and memory utilization. When you're deploying an LLM on a GPU or other accelerator, um, CPU and memory are not good indicators of the load, so I wouldn't recommend these. Concurrency and RPS are better options, but they're not perfect because, again, uh, the number of requests that, can, that a deployment can handle will depend on the sequence lengths of those incoming requests. So recommendations might be KV cache utilization or queue size, which is what they said in the previous talk. Um, I think it would also be interesting to experiment with actually load, uh, sorry, auto scaling based on the latency metrics that are reported by VLM. Um, so there's many options to consider in terms of which triggers to use to scale up the number of replicas. Um, but regardless of how auto scaling is triggered, the thing that you will need to optimize is how quickly your new model replica is ready after being scaled up. Um, so in the next couple of slides, I'm going to dig a little bit into that and discuss delays involved in scaling up new replicas. So the major sources of delay when you're starting up a new replica of your model can include um, pulling the inference server image. For instance, VLLM, the container image, is like 5 gigabytes when compressed and 10 gigabytes uncompressed. Um, and then downloading the model files is another big source of delay. If you're running in the cloud and you're storing your models in S3, then depending on the configuration, this can add a huge delay. Also, depending on the size of your model, this could add a huge delay. If you're using KServe and using S3 as the storage source in your inference service, then every pod will need to download the model. Once the model files are downloaded, they need to be loaded from disk into GPU memory before the inference server can start serving requests. And this can take anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes, depending on how large your model is and how fast your storage is. Um, and then there's other steps at the runtime level that can add additional delay. Uh, depending on your accelerator stack, you might get a big performance improvement by doing some like warm-up phase before you start serving requests to optimize the um, kernels for the accelerator. Um, so some of these have kind of obvious solutions, like cache the model locally, don't download it to, uh, for each replica when they're running on the same node, and use fast storage if you can, and of course, if possible, store your container image and model files somewhere where they can be downloaded quickly. Um, but on the right, I have some performance results kind of illustrating the impact on user experience if you don't do any of these things right. Um, so I'm running a load test at a request rate which two pods can easily handle, but is too much for one pod to handle. Um, looking at the timeline on the bottom, shortly after starting the load test, um, auto-scaling triggers pod one to start up. In this case, I'm running my model on nodes where the OS root volume is pretty slow. It was backed by a GP3 EBS volume, and I wasn't asking for any specified number of IOPS. Um, so this causes the storage init step where the model is downloaded from S3 to take like five minutes. Uh, and then once it's downloaded, it has to be copied into GPU memory, which is again slow because the read speeds on this volume. Um, so in total, the time between pod one, uh, when pod one is created and then when it's actually serving requests is something like seven to eight minutes. Um, and the impact is that pod zero's batching capability is quickly maxed out. So the queue grows and grows um, until requests are waiting over a minute, and then we see requests timing out. Um, so once pod one is finally ready, the two replicas quickly catch up, and then we bring back the TTFT down to like under one second. 
Um, and then also on the top graph, you can see the ITL uh, stabilizes a bit once both uh, replicas are serving requests. So now I'm showing results of this same experiment uh, when we're doing some things right to make the second pod load much faster. In this case, I'm using a KSER feature called model cars. Um, and this allows us to load model files directly from a container image. This helps a lot because it allows us to cache model files locally so they don't need to be pulled twice to the same node. Um, of course, we could accomplish this, this same thing by using like a PVC uh, with local storage. But model cars is kind of nice, in my opinion, because it simplifies the orchestration quite a bit. Uh, we don't need to create a PVC and set up local storage. It just leverages the existing logic that's built into Kubernetes to pull and cache uh, container images. Uh, one shortcoming, I guess, that I will note for model cars is that for large models, which could reasonably be like over 100 gigabytes, some configuration will be needed to uh, allow for container images of this size. In general, container registries don't really support this. It's not really what they were designed for. But I think this is something the community can maybe come together and, and make some improvements. Um, so for this experiment, I'm also using a faster storage for the node's root volume. So I switched from an EBS GP3 volume to IO1. And then I'm also uh, configured it for 64K IOPS. So that also speeds up the model load time. Um, and it also speeds up um, how fast the model car image is loaded. Um, and you can see that when we configure these things correctly, we bring the startup time down to from like seven to eight minutes down to about 40 seconds. Uh, we're not seeing any requests time out and the peak TTFT during this time while we're waiting for the second replica to come up uh, is about 20 seconds. Of course, 20 seconds is still a long time to wait for a request. There's definitely further room for improvement here, I think, in the model load time at the runtime level. Um, okay, so this concludes the auto-scaling part of the talk. So I just want to con conclude by summarizing what I showed. So when comparing, again, k-native request-based load balancing to the random load balancing that you get with replicas behind a service, Request-based load balancing does way better in terms of TTFT and a bit better even in terms of throughput and ITL. Um, but we can get even further imp performance improvement by load balancing based on custom metrics like KV cache utilization and queue size. Um, and then on the auto-scaling side of things, I just want to highlight that you need to be careful how you uh, configure your deployments because if you're not careful, model loading time can be quite long. Uh, and then I also want to highlight model cars again, which is a nice way to do this with KServe uh, to cache model files locally via containers. I have some future ideas or sort of extensions of this work I want to note as well. First of all, doing some more experiments with auto scaling based on custom metrics like ITL or KV cache. Um, although the results for that, you can watch the recording of the previous talk again. Um, and then along these lines, I also want to call out uh, the feature requests for auto, auto scaling based on cu custom metrics in KServe. So there's some issues open on GitHub. Uh, if anyone from the community wants to take a swing at that, I think it would be a great contribution. Um, I also wanted to mention the Fast Safe Tensors project. This is a Python package which aims to speed up model loading by leveraging NVIDIA GPU direct storage, which basically loads model weights directly from NVMe into GPU memory without going through system memory. Um, so that's something that hopefully will get supported at the runtime level soon. Um, and lastly, I want to shout out working group serving, uh, and in particular, the effort to create a community standard tool for LLM load testing. Uh, in this talk, I think I really just scratched the surface on some of these topics. So if this, these topics are interesting to you, you should definitely get involved in the serving working group. Okay, thank you for listening. I'd be happy to take any questions. There is a microphone over there uh, if you have any questions. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Uh, you mentioned about VLLM and KSERV. When I checked the documentation, it says uh, VLLM is still experimental. Does KSERV require VLLM for serving, or are there specific use cases where it would be required? Uh, yeah, so KSERV definitely doesn't require VLLM. Um, I'm basically using a serving runtime to define like a custom runtime. Uh, I think KSERV come, like, basically has some supported runtimes that come with it. Um, but yeah, you can basically use any, any runtime that you want with KSERV. There's no dependency there. And uh, when would uh, you recommend using VLLM with KSERV? Um, that's an interesting question. Yeah, so I mean, I mentioned there's many inference engines out there that you could use for serving LLMs. Uh, I think VLLM has a lot of community support and like a lot of, um, it's moving very quickly. 
getting the latest and greatest performance optimizations in. So I guess I'd say if you want to deploy an LLM, VLLM would be my runtime of choice. So um, yeah, I don't know beyond that. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Well, very, very insightful. Thanks a lot. Um, I had a question around like the uh, the load balancing part uh, as well as the auto scaling, and uh, wondering whether there was any consideration about like uh, having some uh, logic for rate limiting somehow dynamically the uh, request to avoid like overloading like uh, one replica, for instance, when you had only one, and whether yeah. that would help the uh, TTF or ITL. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, one thing I will note is. Um, with KServe, you can set like a max container concurrency. So I didn't do that in any of my tests. Okay. But basically, if you wanted to make sure that the queue never went over a certain value, or you just wanted to control the level of concurrency that ever made it, uh, the queue proxy can do that. So basically, the queue proxy, it'd basically be moving the queue from the VLLM level up one level, um, which I think in some scenarios wouldn't make a difference. But in the case where like you auto scale and then add a new replica, those requests that timed out might not have timed out if you had been queuing uh, at the queue proxy level instead of at the VLM level. So yeah, I wasn't using that case or feature, but there is a case or feature to do that. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. I was wondering, like, uh, if, for instance, like uh, having lower priority for larger requests to uh, give further uh, throughput uh, would be. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting things you could do there. I don't think there's any support for that in yeah. KSERV, but I think, yeah, there is some interesting things you could do. Because, uh, of course, you don't know the number of output tokens that will be yeah. generated, but you do know how long the input prompt is. Um, so I think like a custom load balancer could definitely take that into account. Thanks a lot. No problem. Hi. So again, a great talk. So one thing, uh, so do you have any recommendation, like, you know, if there's a large model, do you recommend to put it in S3 compared to BBC, compared to ML for tracking server, compared to any other place have you seen? which gives better I don't know, performance or be better load time uh, instead of, you know, like a standardized process? Um, so just to make sure I understood the question, you're sure. basically asking if you're trying to run a large model, do I have a recommendation of like how you should store it store in order to exactly. load it quickly? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, in my like experiments running like a 7 dB model, mm -hmm. uh, I'd never store it in S3 because it just takes too long. And <laughs> since I'm playing with like performance settings on VLLM, restarting it takes too long. So I always use a PVC with local storage. Um, I think model cars is another, you know, you can also use that. It basically accomplishes the same thing of caching it on your node. Um, I think if you're doing like auto scaling, especially node auto, yeah, node auto scaling is something I didn't even get into in this talk. If you're doing node auto scaling with a large model, uh, you're going to basically have to over provision your cluster. So that you have time to pre-pull that, because it's like a 70 B model. It's it's huge. It's 140 gig. Uh, it's going to take a long time to download, basically, no matter where you put it. Um, but yeah, I would definitely recommend like local storage or using model cars. Thank you. Hi, nice talk. So I was wondering, and uh, your custom load balancing, you use this, and the uh, power of two choices over the absolute least loaded is because of the performance overhead and the scalability, or have you compared this? Yeah, to thank you for asking. Um, that's a good question. So I did play with like considering all options instead of using just the pick two and pick the better of the two. Uh, and basically, the way I implemented it, I had one thread that was doing like the metric scraping and then communicating it to the, like, client, uh, the, the load test user threads. Um, and so basically, depending on the frequency of how often I scrape the metrics, you get better or worse performance by considering all options. Um, like if the frequency of scraping the metric is too low, then you end up with a burst of requests that all end up at that one that did have the lowest KV cache usage. But then after that burst of requests, it is like oversaturated and you have some queue. So in general, I got kind of better results with the power of two. Um, and then, yeah, there's also like the overhead of if you increase the frequency of scraping, then you're kind of bombarding your replicas with a bunch of metric scraping requests. Um, I didn't completely get down to the bottom of whether that was making a difference in performance, but um, yeah, I, I liked what I was getting with the power of two, I guess. Yeah, it makes sense. Theoretically, for large scale system, I think power of two choices is a better one. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, I know you mentioned that you didn't go into auto uh, scaling for multi node deployments, but I mean, any tips on how, how to think about this for the 405B? Model deployment across like two nodes, you know, eight GPUs each. Yeah, yeah. The connect is uh, also going to be an issue. Uh, 
So, OK, just to make sure I understood, are you talking about auto scaling 405B when you're running it across multiple nodes, or just in general deploying the 405B? Uh, yeah, like well, guess, uh, yeah. So does KSERV support that? Uh, I guess VLLM does support it now. So KSERV as an extension should support that, but you know, have um, tried the auto scaling version of that. Uh, okay. So I think as of today, KSERV does not. It's in the master branch. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's it's uh it's moving rapidly. So I guess I don't have the latest information on multi-node uh, deployments with KSERV. So yeah, I know there's a lot of work there in like the serving working group community and in the KSERV community. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the great talk. Um, so uh, like a lot of what you said about load balancing is also, um, I mean, discussed in uh, working group serving about LLM instance gateway, right? So do you think um, whatever you're doing is almost alike what is happening there? Or, or like, what's the differences mainly? Um, I guess the honest answer is I'm not up to date with everything going on in the LLM instance gateway. I know they're doing some really interesting things that kind of go beyond what I talked about in terms of like uh, load balancing with different LoRa adapters and um, load balancing to different models that are running. Um, so, but in terms of like load balancing by KV Cache, I think they are aware of that and have implemented it in the LLM instance gateway. Okay, cool. And um, I mean, um, I'll I did see a lot of talks about Rayserve and KServe. So over here, you went with KServe. So uh, what was the notion of your choice? Like, what's the thought process? That's a good question. Um, I don't know all the pros and cons because I have never used Rayserve. So I guess that's like the short answer. So I, I don't want to misrepresent anything about Rayserve by trying okay. to give an answer. <laughs> All right, and um, what's the uh, like? Um, so I know that KServe is also going to do like some request routing. Um, I mean, if you have multiple LLMs hosted, right? So let's say I have like a vanilla VLM and um, I'm hosting the same model. Uh, I mean, with KServe as well. So by directly hitting the server and by hitting it through KServe, uh, do you have any latency implications over there? Like, uh, what do you see in your benchmarks, or have you done some? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So. I, from my benchmarking, I've basically seen almost no overhead. Um, I think the reality is like any little bit of few millisecond difference, uh, you ba would barely notice it because these requests are like so long lived and the time to first token is already going to be like in the hundreds of milliseconds. Um, but the short answer is basically no, I've never seen any, any noticeable difference in latency with KSERV versus with like raw deployment. Got it. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you.